Due to the graphic nature of this cult's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of murder and assault that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. It was March 14, 1990, and the world was ending. A nuclear war was imminent within the next 24 hours. Only the chosen ones could survive the coming apocalypse by taking refuge in their homemade set of seven underground bomb shelters in Montana. At least that's what the more than 10,000 members of the Church Universal and Triumphant thought. They were sure they'd survive the fallout. The rest of the world would burn in the fires of nuclear radiation reduced to smoldering ash. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults. Today we're going to take a deep dive into the Church Universal and Triumphant, led by Elizabeth Clare Prophet, a cult leader that believed she could channel the voices of saints, Jesus, and Buddha. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Cults, you can find them on your favorite podcast directory or on our website, parcast.com. And don't forget to subscribe while you're there, because a new episode comes out every Tuesday. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram, at Parcast, and on Twitter, at Parcast Network. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. Elizabeth convinced her followers that the world was ending, and oversaw the construction of the largest private underground bomb shelter in the United States big enough to hold 750 people. In anticipation of this, church members had run up thousands of dollars of bad checks, quit their jobs, and prepared to descend into the darkness. And on the morning of March 15, 1990, when the world didn't end, a majority of the members stayed with the church, eagerly awaiting Elizabeth Prophet's next dictation from one of many long-dead saints. The Church Universal and Triumphant can trace its roots back to 1958, when it was called Summit Lighthouse, founded by Mark Prophet. Yes, that was his real last name. In 1961, Mark met Elizabeth Claire Wolfe, who would soon marry Mark. When Mark died suddenly of a stroke in the winter of 1973, Elizabeth immediately took over Summit Lighthouse. Wanting a new name for the organization so she could put her own stamp on it, She chose Church Universal and Triumphant. Their religion was centered around the belief that the church's leaders were in direct communication with dead saints and religious figures known as masters, and that these masters were dictating vitally important messages to them. The watchdog site All About Cults has more. Quote, ascended masters once lived on earth Through reincarnation, they have rid themselves of negative karma and have ascended back to their divine source or God. Members also believe in a violet flame, energy that can ward off bad karma and make it easier to ascend to God." The church's philosophy also pulled together bits of Christianity, Buddhism, positive thinking, and New Age lore. In addition, they felt that rapid chanting could get you what you wanted and called down vengeance. Vice confirmed that was recorded by Elizabeth Prophet's son, Sean, for the purpose of spreading the glory of the church far and wide. The cult is toned down, but is still very active today and still maintains the bomb shelters. In part one, we'll focus on Church Universal and Triumphant's co-founder, Elizabeth Prophet, and her journey from acolyte to the church's longest serving leader. In part two, we'll look at the experiences of the people who signed on to be a part of the church and get a closer look at Elizabeth's children, especially Aaron and Sean, both of whom grew disenchanted with the cult. We know considerably more about Elizabeth Clare Prophet's background than several other cult leaders' origins, thanks to a book of Elizabeth's own writings. Additionally, Elizabeth's daughter, Erin, wrote a memoir called Prophet's Daughter that was published in 2008. Prophet's Daughter was an invaluable book in finding out more about Church Universal and Triumphant, and we draw on it substantially for part one. 
Elizabeth Clare Prophet was born Elizabeth Wolfe on April 25, 1939 in Long Branch, New Jersey. Elizabeth's early life was not easy. She recounts in her memoir, In My Own Words, how when she was three, her father Hans, a German immigrant, was arrested by the FBI. In March of 1942, two FBI agents showed up at the Wolf's house to accuse Hans, an engineer working at a boatyard, of being a German spy. The charges turned out to be groundless, and Elizabeth and others suspected that it was a business competitor of Hans who made the false accusation. Nevertheless, Hans was held by the FBI at Ellis Island for six weeks. The Association for Psychological Science confirms that being denied control at an early age can result in a strong desire for control over others. Vanessa is going to take over on the psychology here and throughout the episode. Please note, Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she has done a lot of research for this show. Thanks, Greg. This early trauma of seeing her father taken away and locked up could have caused significant trust issues with institutions and caused Elizabeth to seek control over not just her life, but the lives of other people. Despite the trauma, Elizabeth always tried to frame her father's arrest in a positive light. Her father told her that his secretary and his lawyer, both Jewish, had given testimonials on his behalf. He told her she should be a friend to Jews and anyone else who was being persecuted. Standing up for the persecuted is a noble idea and one that can help many people when put into practice. But Sarah Benton, a licensed mental health counselor, notes in Psychology Today that if you take this belief too far, if you start to think it's your job to rescue large numbers of people, it can become what's called a savior complex. It's a psychological construct which makes a person feel the need to save other people and often results in them sacrificing their own needs for others. Benton notes that it's a quality often found in high-functioning alcoholics or children of alcoholics. Elizabeth's father was an alcoholic, and after World War II ended, his alcoholism got worse. Elizabeth writes about his violent temper and her mortification when he would yell at their mother, and she states that those nights were a nightmare. She describes one harrowing evening when her father, who owned three 40-gallon fish tanks, smashed all three in a bout of unprovoked rage and did nothing while she and her mother scrambled to save the fish. Elizabeth cites her father's drinking as the cause of his downfall when it came to his boatyard job. According to the organization Adult Children of Alcoholics, ACA, the psychological trauma of having an alcoholic, unstable parent cannot be overstated. Living in a home where a parent is an alcoholic can generate catastrophic levels of uncertainty. Some additional traits in adults who are children of alcoholics include an overdeveloped sense of responsibility, an addiction to excitement, and very harsh self-judgment. One trauma caused by an alcoholic household can leave children with a terror at the possibility of being abandoned. They will do anything to prevent people from leaving and since they did not have structure, they're driven to create it for themselves and others. In her own book, Elizabeth says that uncertainty and instability led her to seek out structure and order in the form of Christian science. Her parents let her choose her own religion at age nine. But in high school, she had started to explore ESP, reincarnation, astral projection, and other curious ideas that Christian scientists in her hometown did not approve of. We don't always associate New Age beliefs with cults. Usually, New Age implies alternative health, positive energy, and freer spirits. But the website cultresearch.org reports that one of the appealing factors of New Age cults is their transcendent belief system. A singular belief system offers an overarching theory of everything that completely explains the past, present, and future, including the steps to salvation, along with an exact set of steps for the personal transformation necessary for salvation. Elizabeth may have been seeking such a unifying theory when she went off to college, first to Antioch and then transferring to Boston University in 1959. As Elizabeth's daughter Erin recounts, Elizabeth met Mark Prophet when she attended her first meeting of a group known as Summit Lighthouse in Boston on April 22, 1961. She was 22 years old.
Mark Prophet also grew up in a broken home. He was born in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin in 1918. In 1928, when Mark was nine, his father died. Erin writes about Mark in her book-length exploration of the cult, Prophet's Daughter. She discloses that Mark grew up taunted by people in town for his poverty and that he was an awkward loner. According to Aaron, the humiliation Mark Prophet experienced caused him to be hypersensitive to any slight, real or imagined. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders confirms that this is a trait common to narcissists. The self-image of a narcissist is so fragile that the slightest criticism will cause him or her to lash out violently, attempting to dominate and destroy the critic. A narcissist will further attempt to rally his or her followers to condemn the critic or threat, whether real or imagined. Aaron recounts that as Mark traveled as a salesman in his 30s, between 1948 and 1956, he grew more extroverted and began to dabble in Hindu ideas. His salesman job took him all across the Midwest, and his natural curiosity, plus a desire to meet as many potential clients as possible, led him to visit many different types of religious services during that time. Mark tried to start groups that promoted meditation for world peace and yoga, radical ideas in the 1950s, but these groups did not take off. Mark married his first wife, Phyllis, in 1946, but she did not share his unusual ideas, which included an affinity for a group called I Am. I Am was a 1935 book written by Guy and Edna Ballard, who were of the first people to claim they were taking dictation directly from immortal masters. The Ballards had become popular after Guy Ballard published a book in the 1930s called The I Am Discourses, written in the voice of the long-dead Count of St. Germain, a European count who lived in the 1700s. In the book, the Ballards claimed to have had out-of-body experiences and that they had been anointed by St. Germain as official messengers. Mark had attended a presentation they gave in 1956 in Los Angeles and was entranced by their confidence and what seemed to be real voices from long dead figures. In addition to delivering messages from dead saints, the I Am movement had some of its roots in the positive thinking movement, which promoted the idea that you can cure yourself of physical diseases just with your mind. In the Skeptics Dictionary, Robert Todd Carroll writes that this is an empowerment delusion. That term covers the belief that you can get money, success, or good fortune just by thinking about it. In 1958, when he turned 39, Mark founded Summit Lighthouse, his own New Age independent religious study group. Summit Lighthouse also believed that certain people could take dictation from dead saints. This was blended with a firm belief in reincarnation and the idea that you could literally detect spiritual light coming off of people. The group's beginnings were not auspicious. Aaron Prophet writes, his early services, attended by four people, were held in an attic chapel, furnished with nothing but a statue of Buddha, a bare 300-watt light bulb, a table, and a few chairs. Doctor of Psychology John M. Grohl notes that narcissists tend to be highly determined and can project self-confidence. Mark would have needed this to keep Summit Lighthouse going in those dark early days. The small audiences didn't deter Mark. He began mailing out his weekly letter from the Masters and publishing his dictated messages from the Masters, which he called Pearls of Wisdom in 1958, which enabled him to reach larger audiences. Other New Age groups started asking him to speak, and audiences at his own weekly services and lectures began to grow. People responded well to what Aaron calls Mark's earthy preaching style. Mark soon realized that the interest of people at Summit Lighthouse meetings rose dramatically when he spoke in the voices of dead religious figures from the past. Like the Ballards, he called the figures messengers and masters, and claimed they lived in invisible caves inside of mountains. We cannot know for certain whether Mark believed he was actually channeling messengers, but we have no information to indicate he did not. The 1950s were a stifling time when it came to convention, especially religion. A person seeking a religion that was less restrictive would have found Mark's unusual combination compelling. 
The combination of reincarnation, Buddhism, the less restrictive parts of Christianity, dictation from saints, alternative health, and positive thinking were an appealing mix. And Mark's personal charisma went a long way towards recruiting new followers. If you liked Guy Ballard's book, I Am, you would love Summit Lighthouse. Elizabeth Claire Wolf was a fan of the book. She was already open to the idea that dead religious figures could dictate to the living. In April 1961, she attended her first Summit Lighthouse meeting, one where Mark delivered a dictation. Mark's first words in that fateful meeting came directly from Michael, Prince of the Archangels, who said, quote, Hail, O mankind of earth. I, Michael, Prince of the Archangels, salute this earth in the name of the infinite blue lightning of cosmic Christ's protection, end quote. Both Mark and the Ballards claimed that they would also receive visions at various points. In the Skeptic's Dictionary, Carol goes on to say, the empowerment delusion leads people to believe that they can create health or wealth by willing it or asking a god to will it. Aaron doesn't say whether Mark tried to will Elizabeth into his life, but that night Elizabeth realized she wanted to be a messenger, and Mark realized that, despite the fact that he was still married to Phyllis, he wanted to be with Elizabeth. He promptly pursued her. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 4th edition, known as the DSM-4, also confirms that grandiosity and a lack of social inhibition, which could have contributed to Mark's ardent pursuit of Elizabeth, are common traits of narcissists. Curiously, some qualities of narcissists also make them seemingly good leaders until the cracks in their facades appear. In June of 1961, three months after Elizabeth's first Summit Lighthouse meeting, she experienced her first of what would be many visions as an adult. She was walking through a park near Symphony Hall in Boston. Aaron writes that El Moria, an Asian-seeming master with a turban, spoke to Elizabeth and said, quote, I have need of a feminine messenger. Go to Washington to be trained, end quote. There are many different explanations as for why someone might have or claim to have religious visions. As Grohl wrote in his paper, quote, grandiose delusions may have religious content, such as the person believes he or she has received a special message from God or another deity, end quote. We see here that Elizabeth was already preparing herself for a time when she could take more of a leadership role. After the vision, Elizabeth wrote to Mark and visited him in Washington, D.C., where he now lived. Mark's interest in Elizabeth wasn't just romantic. His health wasn't great, and he realized that it would not be a bad idea to have a protege, someone who could keep the flame going if he got too sick to lead the church. As a possible result of the stress from starting Summit Lighthouse, Mark was already suffering from ulcers and kidney stones. As Mark trained Elizabeth, he pursued her romantically, his then-wife, Phyllis, did not support his religious work, and here was a young woman who believed in it fully. But Elizabeth was reluctant. Mark was married. He was 20 years older than she was. He had dropped out of school in the 10th grade. And a few key members of Summit, which Mark relied on for financial support, warned him that they would leave if Mark ever let Elizabeth speak as a messenger. They had negative stereotypes about women being messengers. But Mark, determined, visited her in person multiple times. He assured her he would divorce Phyllis before long and, indeed, initiated divorce proceedings shortly thereafter. Their marriage had been strained for some time, and Mark's interest in Elizabeth gave him the final push. His messenger, St. Germain, was helpful too. Mark delivered a letter apparently dictated by St. Germain that said marriage would offer protection for their joint work and compared them to Joseph and Mary, Elizabeth was still skeptical. But in 1963, when Mark's divorce to Phyllis was finalized, he won Elizabeth over, and they were married. He was 44, she was just 23. While both were dedicated to Summit Lighthouse, neither of them had any idea that in just over 25 years, hundreds of cult members would be headed underground, firmly believing a nuclear apocalypse was just hours away. Our story will continue in a moment after the break. As the giant grew closer, 
Enceladus realized something was wrong. Instead of legs, Enceladus and his brother giants slithered on two large serpents with snapping maws where the feet should be. But this giant's serpents weren't snapping, and its face sagged. An arrow whizzed past Enceladus' face. This wasn't a giant. It was a god. You foolish, foolish giant. No one rebels against the gods and escapes unscathed. Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, peeled off the face of a giant she'd flayed alive, revealing her own face dripping with blood. Hi there, I'm hosting a brand new show on Parcast called Mythology. It dramatizes ancient myths for a modern audience and dives into their history, origins, and meaning. I've already listened to part one, and I can't wait for part two. Stick around after this episode to hear a preview of Mythology's part one on the Greek goddess Athena. New episodes come out every Tuesday. Search for and subscribe to Mythology wherever you listen to podcasts. Now, the story continues. The decade between 1963 and 1973 was good for both Mark and Elizabeth and Summit Lighthouse. In 1964, Elizabeth gave birth to her and Mark's first son, Sean. Additionally, Elizabeth and Mark realized that several of their new subscribers lived in the Rocky Mountains area, and in January of 1966, the Prophets moved from Washington, D.C. to the friendlier city of Colorado Springs. Summit Lighthouse continued to grow in membership through the 1960s, aided by that decade's cultural awakening and new freedoms. The Prophets began to publish books with titles like Climb the Highest Mountain, The Everlasting Gospel, and The Masters and Their Retreats. As competition from other New Age groups with Eastern religious undertones increased, the Prophets had to deal with the competition and Mark had been fascinated by Baird Spaulding's book about Eastern masters. So they started looking for a true Indian guru who could enhance Summit Lighthouse's spirituality even further. But they couldn't find one in the United States. So in 1970, the prophets took Sean and their young daughters, Aaron and Moira, to India, accompanied by 30 of Summit's proudest students. As Summit Lighthouse had grown, Mark and Elizabeth started facing questions from skeptical visitors about whether they were better gurus than other New Age cult leaders and demanding that they materialize small objects like crosses out of thin air, which a guru named Satya Sai Baba claimed to be able to do. The trip to India was not as successful as Mark and Elizabeth had hoped. Holy men refused to meet with them, viewing them as usurpers, they could not persuade anyone in India to join their group. They somehow managed to get a meeting with India's powerful Prime Minister, Indira Gandhi, but she was not interested in their teachings or the words of the masters. They did find one lone Swami to teach them some new meditation and breathing exercises, however, which the prophets cheerfully incorporated into their services back in America. In February of 1973, tragedy struck. At the age of 54, Mark Prophet suffered a massive stroke and died. The Prophets had four children at this point, Sean, Aaron, Mora, and Tatiana. Tatiana was just 13 months old. Elizabeth Prophet's top priority when Mark died was to ensure that Summit Lighthouse continued to exist and that there was continuity. Elizabeth believed passionately in Summit Lighthouse's mission. She and Mark had been in complete agreement on that. By this point, Summit had more than 100 followers at its Colorado headquarters who worked for the church full-time, called Staff. Prophet's daughter details that first meeting with Staff after Mark's passing. She said she had a message from Mark. If anything happened to him, she should take all the followers and go to Montana. Elizabeth was only 33. But after she received another vision from the Masters that summer of 1973, Elizabeth directed the Summit Lighthouse membership to follow her to California instead, saying the Masters had postponed the Montana journey. And so, the entire group eventually packed up and moved, settling in Pasadena, California by 1976. Grief can be a tremendously disruptive force. 
As Elizabeth Kubler-Ross noted in her book, The Five Stages of Grief, people cling to comfort, stability, and routine wherever they can find it. By providing that stability to the grieving members, Elizabeth ensured that she would lead Summit Lighthouse without challenge. She'd been the one working most closely with Mark, so she didn't have any real competition for the job. To expand the church's membership, she embarked on a nationwide lecture tour designed to introduce the curious to Church Universal and Triumphant and massively expanded its mailing list. Former members of the church have talked about how good Elizabeth was at establishing an instant personal rapport with them from the first time they met her. One said that after 10 minutes with Elizabeth, it felt like she'd known them for a lifetime. Later in 1973, Elizabeth married Randall King, a younger member of the church, and appointed him church president. This proved to be a poor decision. Aaron Prophet recalls that King embarked on an illegal get-rich-quick scheme, borrowing money from the church and investing it in silver futures. When King was caught in 1974, Elizabeth persuaded the church to cover his losses. As Psychology Today notes, narcissists put their own feelings, in this case Elizabeth's need to protect her husband, ahead of others' needs, the need of the church to have stable finances. Despite this bump, Summit Lighthouse continued to grow. In 1975, Summit had grown large enough, thanks to Elizabeth's tireless efforts, that its board of directors felt it needed to incorporate. Elizabeth agreed. In the hangover after the free love decade, its ethos attracted many willing new members in Pasadena, only minutes away from Los Angeles. In 1975, it had grown to a size where both Elizabeth and several senior staff members felt it made sense to incorporate. Elizabeth named the newly incorporated organization Church Universal and Triumphant. Elizabeth's choice of name is revealing. Church Universal and Triumphant suggests a far greater ambition than Mark had. This was the truth, and it was meant for everyone. Between 1975 and 1980, the church experienced steady growth from its California base and added a location in Calabasas, California. The church had always taken tithes and donations, but the growth helped them to expand their finances. Church gross revenue grew to over $100,000 a year during this time. Elizabeth's speaking skills, already formidable, developed to a point where she could stand and lecture for 10 hours at a time without a break. And now her preaching took on a sterner tone. She inveighed strongly against moral relativism, the idea that there is no fixed idea of what's right and wrong. The Ballards, the founders of the I Am group that inspired the church, had always predicted natural disasters and compared modern society to the lost colony of Atlantis. Atlantis, New Age leader said, sunk because its residents had been evil. Before he died, Mark Prophet had been predicting the downfall of society since the porn movie Deep Throat opened in June of 1972. Every cult needs an enemy, and the moral failings of civilization make a good one. These more urgent concerns about society may have contributed to the decision to move the headquarters to a much more isolated area of Montana. In 1980, Elizabeth finally divorced Randall. According to Aaron Prophet, the end of the marriage was triggered in part when Elizabeth found out Randall was having an affair with his secretary. Divorce had become an increasingly accepted option through the 1970s. National Affairs notes that a psychological shift had swept the country, changing our ideas of a good marriage from one in which partners met their obligations to one in which each partner was subjectively happy. Possibly as a way to make a clean break after her divorce in 1981, Elizabeth purchased a 12,000-acre ranch in Montana on the northern border of Yellowstone Park, about 100 miles away from Bozeman. This ranch would eventually be transformed into a full-service compound of the church Universal and Triumphant, where members could live. Preparations to convert it began immediately, but the California headquarters would be maintained for the time being. Elizabeth may have felt it was her destiny to buy the Montana ranch. It had been a longtime wish of her husband, but it also gave her a chance to tie the prophecies to real-life annoyances. The California zoning boards were giving the church difficulties over expansions the church wanted to build. So clearly, it was a sign that God wanted them to move away from California. 
Helping with the move was a church member named Edward Francis. Edward's financial skills, he was a thorough bookkeeper, had already helped the church maintain its nonprofit status when the IRS investigated, and he had been instrumental in the Montana purchase of what they called the ranch. And in October of 1981, Elizabeth Prophet would marry him, finding him a far more stable and suitable husband than Randall. Erin notes that her mother took the initiative in pursuing Edward. After the bitter end to her marriage with Randall, Elizabeth would have seen Edward's stability as extremely appealing. A few church staff and members would move to Montana in 1981 and 1982 to start building tanks on the ranch to house drinking water, as well as their own septic system. As Charles Chandler notes in his essay, Cult Psychology, smart cult leaders isolate people from their friends and family outside the cult, but they do it by imperceptible degrees, so most followers don't notice. Isolation brings many benefits for cult leaders. And this ranch was much more isolated than Church Universal and Triumphant's past headquarters in the Santa Monica Mountains, a couple of hours northwest of Los Angeles. The nearest town of Bozeman had only 30,000 people in it. The ranch would enable church members to almost completely cut themselves off from the outside world. As Chandler writes, the cult leader can talk people into doing things with him, but when these people return to their daily lives, the effect wears off. Friends and family nudge them towards reasonable behavior. While Church Universal and Triumphant's mixture of beliefs was largely the same, Elizabeth's dictations had started to take on a more political tone. She and Mark had always been fervently anti-communist, and her anti-communist intensity only expanded with Ronald Reagan's election. She felt vindicated by the rise of someone so strongly against communism. She believed the masters were using her to fight a global communist takeover that would start with the USSR. This created some awkward moments with her followers, as they tended to be more liberal. Elizabeth would frequently lose audience members when she tried to talk about the international communist conspiracy or mentioned her opposition to abortion but they still responded well to the dictations from dead saints. Once in Montana, Elizabeth continued her dictations. Now though, she wore 15 rings on her hands, claiming they helped her decipher the master's words and would often hold a sharp two foot long sword while giving decrees. Members of Church Universal and Triumphant talk about experiencing something mystical at the dictations. Erin Prophet writes that she herself experienced heat and a tingling sensation when her mother would give dictations as El Moria. In addition to El Moria, Elizabeth claimed that she was speaking as many different masters, among them Jesus, Buddha, and Saint Germain. Her preaching style was even more dramatic than Mark's and combined a motherly love for her followers with a steely determination to keep them on a righteous path. Linda Debro Marshall and Steve K. Eichel, both PhDs, wrote a 1984 paper entitled The Manipulation of Spiritual Experience, Unethical Hypotheses in Destructive Cults, about this very phenomenon. They disclose that these techniques can induce a trance-like state similar to hypnosis. Her daughter Erin mentions that Elizabeth would announce that the master would touch her followers through her. Erin notes that her mother could stand at an altar for hours with words pouring out of her mouth. Dubrow, Marshall, and Eichel say, quote, being subjected to repeated and prolonged hypnotic inductions can impair the convert's ability to make decisions and evaluate new information. Moreover, the convert's altered awareness can lock in and become a conditioned personality response pattern, end quote. Whether or not Elizabeth was aware of the psychological impact of these hypnosis-like effects, she could not have been blind to the ecstatic response of the church's followers. But not all of the followers were so supportive. In November 1981, a former member of the church, Gregory Mull, turned against Elizabeth and spoke out. He began a letter-writing campaign and traveled to Montana to attend town meetings, where he would falsely accuse the church of wanting to take over Montana counties. His campaign against Elizabeth signified a turning of the tide for the church universal and triumphant. Our story will continue in a moment after a brief message. And now, back to cults. 
In November of 1981, one of Elizabeth Clare Prophet's former followers began a slander campaign against Church Universal and Triumphant. This could have been a traumatizing blow to Elizabeth. She may have seen it as a betrayal. Joanna Ashman's article, How to Recognize a Narcissist, says, Narcissists are extremely sensitive to personal criticism. And after Mull began speaking out against the church, Elizabeth decided she had no choice but to sue him. Gregory Mull had borrowed $32,000 from the church and only paid back $5,500. Elizabeth exploited this in an attempt to silence Mull and stop his criticisms. Rather than try to settle out of court, Gregory Mull countersued Elizabeth and the church for over $253 million, claiming the church had inflicted emotional distress during his six years there. According to Aaron Prophet, Elizabeth claimed that Gregory Mull was an evil reincarnation of Pope Gregory. It's unknown why this particular pope was claimed, probably because he had the same name. Elizabeth also said he was the literal mouthpiece of the beast of blasphemy from Revelation. Joanna Ashman goes on to write, quote, Narcissists think that they must be seen as perfect or superior or infallible, next to godlike, if not actually divine, then sitting on the right hand of God, or else they are worthless." End quote. A jury deciding that Elizabeth had been at fault could have triggered feelings of worthlessness in her. Gregory Mull claimed that he had been under mind control when he signed the notes agreeing to pay back the money, and the LA-based jury found it compelling. After five years in courtrooms in the spring of 1986, the jury sided with Mull and ordered the church to pay him $1.5 million in damages, including punitive damages, for the pain he suffered as a result of belonging to the cult. The church had less than $1 million in the bank, which it had carefully saved up from donations and tithings from members. The Bozeman Chronicle confirmed that members were expected to contribute tithings 10% of everything they made. Money also came from secret donations, which were supposed to return to members in spiritual benefits multiplied. Needless to say, this was a devastating blow. Joanna Ashman continues in her article on narcissism, quote, there's no middle ground of ordinary, normal humanity for narcissists. They can't tolerate the least disagreement, end quote. After the trial, the forewoman told Elizabeth that the other members of the jury had been prepared to deliver a verdict of over $5 million, which would have bankrupted the church. So Elizabeth told herself that the verdict could have been a lot worse. $1.5 million was survivable. $5 million was not. Some might see this as a rationalization. Neil Burton, writing in Psychology Today, defines a rationalization as the use of feeble but seemingly plausible arguments either to justify something that is difficult to accept or to make it seem not so bad after all. In 1982, Elizabeth was now dividing her time between California and Montana. There was enough housing on the ranch to host several members, and she had members calling her Ma and Mother by this point but she had also grown somewhat afraid for her safety. Elizabeth's fears may have been somewhat justified. Aaron Prophet writes that the Montana members were getting harassed by locals who lived in a run-down house. The church members had kept themselves isolated, which hadn't endeared themselves to the suspicious townspeople. They'd drive by and yell, Hey, guru slut, come out and play. And so Elizabeth Prophet had some members volunteer as guards. However, writers Madeline Landau Tobias and Yanya Lalich point out in their book Captive Hearts, Captive Minds that paranoia is a common trait among cult leaders and that it is typical of the authoritarian mindset. Elizabeth's decision to have bulletproof glass installed in the area where she performed services could be seen as an example of the paranoia mentioned by Tobias and Lalich. In 1986, with the church still based in California, Elizabeth would soon be granted evidence of God's plan. She had just lost in court to Gregory Mull and been ordered to pay $1.5 million to him, money the church did not have. But that summer of 1986, a different religious organization, Soka Gakkai International, offered $15.5 million for the church's California ranch, planning to turn it into a university for its own religion. 
This enabled the church to safely pay off the judgment and permanently move all its members to Montana. Aaron Prophet writes that despite this positive turn of events, her mother nevertheless wanted to call forth judgments on those responsible for the verdict. She put her hands to her temples, closed her eyes, and asked God as Elohim, angels, and ascended masters to witness her actions. She wanted revenge against those who had wronged her. Psychoanalyst Daniel Shaw writes about narcissists' desires for revenge in his paper, The Relational System of the Traumatizing Narcissist. Shaw writes, quote, it is crucial for the narcissist to keep the destabilizing shame of these repudiated aspects of self from being released into consciousness." End quote. In other words, narcissists cannot face any sort of criticism about themselves, so they lash out. In the fall of 1986, Elizabeth Prophet made one of her first doomsday predictions, speaking as Saint Germain, a direct quote. You have every reason to expect a first strike attack by the Soviet Union upon these United States. The enemy is prepared to survive a nuclear war. The United States is not." End quote. Why are doomsday predictions so appealing to some? In a Scientific American article by Daisy U.S., neuroscientist Shmuel Lisek notes that some apocalyptic believers find the idea that the end is nigh to be validating. They're reassured to discover both that they're not alone in their beliefs and that there's actually a final known date for the apocalypse. On October 2nd, 1987, while on another lecture tour, Elizabeth Prophet got specific. She said to expect an attack within two years time before October 2nd, 1989. This sudden specific timeline caused some church members to start considering building their own shelters in addition to the ones the church had already started constructing. And then Elizabeth Prophet got lucky. On October 3rd, 1987, she predicted judgment and downfall for the moneyed interests of New York. Just one week later, the stock market had a catastrophic crash. Elizabeth's prediction looked eerily accurate and her audiences grew larger. Aaron Prophet tracked the escalating rhetoric of her mother. By the summer of 1988, at age 49, Elizabeth Prophet was openly talking about the literal four horsemen of the apocalypse. For her annual July 4th speech she gave at the Church Montana's headquarters in 1988, there were more than 4,000 people in attendance. Her speech would last for six hours. Elizabeth described the four horsemen of the apocalypse and claimed to have seen them against a full moon, economic disaster, war, global conflict, and plague. Delivering her speech in front of a giant American flag, Elizabeth promised that all was not lost. She told her followers to be a son, not to let darkness defeat them, and encouraged them to take practical steps to protect themselves from the coming nuclear holocaust. Like building bomb shelters, Elizabeth's escalating warnings may have been due to the unlikely successes of the fire and the stock market crash. It may have been similar to an addiction, where a gambler keeps chasing the high that comes from guessing something right. In the mid to late 1980s, Church Universal and Triumphant started gaining greater media attention. The church was written up in the New York Times and by the Associated Press, and international news sources were poking around Montana to tell their readers about the cult. But it also garnered much greater scrutiny Many Montanans had been raising alarm bells about the construction of bomb shelters since the church started building them in 1986. Only a few days after Elizabeth's July 4th speech, the Yellowstone fires would begin ravaging Montana for the rest of July and into August. And on August 4th, 1988, the Fan Creek Fire would come within a quarter mile of the boundary of the ranch. Aaron writes, that fire could have destroyed the heart. Elizabeth's response was to gather 200 followers and, despite being told to evacuate, she, quote, stayed in the heart, facing the flames, our faces whipped by hot ashes and an oven-like wind, end quote. Through an astonishing example of good luck, after two days the fire came no closer and the wind direction changed. The church's ranch had been completely spared from the devastating wildfire. The belief that the church had successfully beaten back the fire via chanting 
is an excellent example of confirmation bias. Chris Lee in the science website Ars Technica describes it as, quote, only looking for data that confirms a desired conclusion. It is used by psychics, mediums, mentalists, and homeopaths, just to name a few, end quote. The fact that the fire had come right up to the edge of the grounds the church was on and then stopped seemed like a miracle. Members' faith in Elizabeth deepened and intensified. But beating a fire wasn't good enough for Elizabeth. As El Moria, she stated that it was the members' fault for allowing the fire to get that close in the first place. She demanded greater weekly attendance at her sermons, and Aaron writes, confessing to the messengers in writing. Members would have to sit down and write out letters that Elizabeth and her senior staff would read, confessing to everything that they'd done that might have violated church rules. Elizabeth Prophet was escalating her demands on her members. She had isolated them, established control over them, and brought them to the point of near certain death at the hands of wildfire. There was nowhere to take them but the end of the world. In the summer of 1989, Vernon Hamilton, former head of church security, was arrested in Montana for illegal weapons purchases. He was buying the weapons for the church. Police found 15 military-style assault rifles, two pistols, 120,000 rounds of tracer and armor-piercing ammunition, and $28,000 in cash and gold in Vernon's pickup and a storage shed. The San Diego Union Tribune reports that members also bought or planned to buy armored personnel carriers and night vision equipment. Marsha R. Rudin from the International Cult Education Program says, quote, some groups stockpile illegal weapons. Cult leaders and members believe the ends justify the means and that what they're doing is more important than society's laws, end quote. Once the nuclear war happened, the church believed it would need weapons to defend the ranch from marauders as society would completely break down. Quoting Rudin again, cult leaders often break civil and criminal laws to advance the organization. They believe their ends justify any means. And then, in the early autumn of 1989, more arrests followed. Church staff member Frank Black was arrested for transporting two semi-automatic weapons to Montana. And Elizabeth's husband, Edward Francis, was arrested for conspiracy to purchase weapons. With the end of the world approaching, Buying weapons makes logical sense. If society completely breaks down, law and order will vanish. Elizabeth had previously stated that there would be a nuclear war before October 2nd, 1989, but had not given a specific date. Elizabeth's efforts to get her followers ready for Armageddon intensified. So did the anger of the nearby townspeople. Although in all fairness, it wasn't really justified. The church members had largely been minding their own business. In Prophet's Daughter, we learn that church members had to contend with vandalism. On one scary occasion, a man with a 22 rifle shot at a line of cars leaving a late night service. Aaron Prophet states, one bullet penetrated a car window, another lodged close to the head of a napping woman in a car. In this case, it's hard not to sympathize with church members. The townspeople's reactions here seem far out of proportion to what the church was actually doing. But the hostile reactions of townspeople may have driven the church further into a herd mentality and accelerated the process of preparing for doomsday. By the fall of 1989, a variety of shelters were under construction. Culverts, underground concrete domes, and basements. At least two environmental groups teamed up with Montana residents to sue the church in order to block further expansion of church property. Specifically, they tried to block the water and sewer permits from being approved, but the Montana Department of Health had recommended that the church be allowed to proceed. The lawsuit only entrenched Elizabeth's belief that the church was not just in a minor bureaucratic dispute, they were in an existential battle for survival, and that the fate of the world was at stake. Aware that time was about to run out and the shelters were not yet complete, Elizabeth suddenly updated her followers. They had been granted a temporary extension by El Moria and the Masters. The new date of impending doom was no longer October 2nd, 1989. It was March 15th, 1990. Shmuel Lissick says that having a precise date for the apocalypse can, paradoxically, be very comforting. 
It's the uncertainty around death that produces most of the anxiety. Knowing an exact end date helps many to stop worrying. But the clock was still ticking, and Elizabeth's predictions had been right more than once. March 15, 1990, would surely bring about Judgment Day. In part two, we'll look at some of the church's followers and explore what made them decide to follow a cult leader underground into bomb shelters and believe that they alone would survive a fiery, radiation-filled nuclear apocalypse. Thanks again for tuning in to Cults. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Cults, you can find them on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify, or on our website, parcast.com, spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review or tell us what you think on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram as at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. It seems simple, but it really helps our show. Cults was created by Max Cutler and is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Kenny Hobbs, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro, Maggie Admire, and Carly Madden. Cults is written by Greg Macklin and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. And here it is, your preview of mythology's first episode on the Greek goddess Athena. I hope you like it. It was foolish to challenge the gods. After battling the goddess Athena for three days, Enceladus had all but resigned himself to the fate of so many of his fellow giants. But he'd escaped her for the moment, and perhaps that would become his advantage. Enceladus had barely caught his breath when he heard the horses. He whipped around, worried Athena had tracked him to the Ionian Sea, but it was one of Enceladus' own, another giant. As the giant grew closer, Enceladus realized something was wrong. Instead of legs, Enceladus and his brother giants slithered on two large serpents with snapping maws where the feet should be. But this giant's serpents weren't snapping, and its face sagged. An arrow whizzed past Enceladus' face. This wasn't a giant. It was a god. You foolish, foolish giant. No one rebels against the gods and escapes unscathed. Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, peeled off the face of a giant she'd flayed alive, revealing her own face dripping with blood. She kept the skin wrapped around her like a cloak. Enceladus's leg serpents snapped and spit at Athena, but their fangs couldn't pierce the hide of his own kind. It was a perfect shield. Athena knocked Enceladus into the Ionian Sea. Then she crouched down and lifted the entire isle of Sycolos. Athena had a divine, godly strength, Plucking an island out of the ocean was as easy for her as it was for a man to pick up his child. Athena straightened up, raising the island above her. She swung it around over Enceladus and slammed the island on his head. Enceladus crumpled under the blow of the island. He sank and then vanished beneath the landmass. His blood and anger rippled outward from the island. The place where Enceladus was defeated became Mount Etna, and the buried giant was reduced to expressing his wrath through eruptions and earthquakes. Yet something wasn't right. As she watched steam build above Mount Etna, Athena knew her heart was missing a piece. She'd used her wisdom and wit to defeat the enemy, embracing her role as a goddess of war, and it felt empty. She was destined for something greater, she was certain. Welcome to Mythology on the Parcast Network. 
Every Tuesday, we present dramatic stories from ancient mythology and explore their origins. I'm your host and narrator, Vanessa Richardson. Today, we're focusing on the Greek goddess Athena. She's the goddess of war and military strategy, but also the goddess of wisdom, civilization, and the arts. In her mythology, she's caught between who she is and who she wants to be. New episodes of Mythology release every Tuesday, and you can find us and all of ParCast's podcasts wherever you listen to podcasts. At ParCast, we are grateful for you, our listeners. You allow us to do what we love. Let us know how we're doing. Reach out on Facebook and Instagram at ParCast and Twitter at ParCast Network. And if you enjoy today's episode, the best way to help us is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. It really does help us. We also now have merchandise. Head to parcast.com slash merch for more information. Something to note in these episodes, all Greek myths have many versions and variations. We've selected those we felt are the most dramatic and entertaining, and supplemented them with additional research into Greek traditions. Additionally, each Greek myth takes place in a wide expanded universe. While we'll cover some major myths of Athena over the next few episodes, this won't be her only appearance in the podcast. Goddess of the arts and of war, Athena exhibits a dichotomy in Greek culture. She's a woman warrior in a culture where women didn't go to war, and a household goddess who vowed to never be a lover or a mother. Athena is masculine, feminine, and something greater than both. She's a goddess for everyone, and a goddess for no one. Ancient Greek society had clear gender roles, treating women as second-class citizens. But Athena exists outside that construct. She'll skin a giant alive, and then go weave a tapestry. She's as apt to teach men gardening and pottery as she is to help them slay their enemies. Unlike her half-brother and rival, Ares, the war god, Athena approaches war with logic and meditation. At the start of a battle, Ares leaps into action, while Athena waits, plans, then leads men to bloody victory. She values rational thinking over emotion, but is not without rage and bloodlust. Classicist Walter F. Otto characterized Athena as the goddess of nearness because she was always beside the Greek heroes in battle, guiding their spears and swords. She is, like all Greek gods, a killer. However, Athena prefers to change errant humans into other forms, doling out punishments while preserving life. She also transforms herself taking a male appearance multiple times in the Iliad and the Odyssey. That isn't to say she doesn't embrace a female role, too. In today's myths, the building of the Palladium, the judgment of Paris, and the story of Arachne, Athena strives to be recognized as feminine. And this may be the hardest battle the goddess of war has ever fought. The king of the gods had a headache. And Zeus's son, Hephaestus, like many children, was only making it worse. Hephaestus was god of the forge, born with a club foot. To him, a headache was nothing. And then I realized I could put another axe head on my existing axe and kill two men with one blow. Genius, right? Oh, my head is killing me. That's the idea. Both heads could kill. Two heads, one axe. Zeus gestured to his forehead, frustrated. It feels like my skull is expanding and contracting. Maybe I should go... Oh, Oh, headache. I thought we were still on axe heads. Zeus continued moaning as he dropped to the floor, gripped his head, and rocked back and forth. Hephaestus looked on, torn between sympathy and opportunity. Anything I can do? Maybe take over your duties for a time? Not that a headache could ever take down the great god Zeus. Oh, Hephaestus, will you... Hephaestus eyed his brand new double-headed axe. Then Zeus doubled over in front of him. The opportunity was ripe. Zeus had overthrown Hephaestus' grandfather. Perhaps patricide ran in the family. Oh, make it stop. End it. 
Cut off my head. Hephaestus hid his grin as he grabbed his double-head axe. After today, the gods of Mount Olympus would bow to Hephaestus. He wound up and aimed straight for Zeus's skull. The axe cleaved Zeus's head in half. As Zeus's eyes spread wide apart, a battle helmet emerged from where his brain should have been. Hephaestus dropped his axe in shock as a fully armored warrior woman sprang from Zeus's head, shouting a battle cry. All thoughts of ruling Mount Olympus faded in the face of this fearsome, beautiful goddess. Ready for battle, Athena stepped out of her father's head and into the light of Mount Olympus. Athena was born without a mother, the child of Zeus alone. She emerged a rational adult, capable of complex thought, and ready to fight for her life. Yet because the Greek gods are modeled on humans, with human flaws and emotions, there is one story of Athena's childhood and a youthful accident that guided the rest of her life. Zeus was accustomed to his children having a mother, so after he fused his head back together, he wasn't sure what to do with Athena. Eventually, the single dad sent his new daughter away to be educated by his nephew, Triton. Triton was a fish-tailed ocean god, so Athena spent much of her time in and around water, and more of her time with Triton's daughter, Pallas. Pallas was a water nymph, a maiden of the ocean, and Athena's only friend. But today, the war goddess and the water nymph raised their swords, squaring off against each other. The pair sparred on the surface of a lake. Pallas floated amid a column of waves, her long hair and shimmering fishtail distracting from her killer aim. Athena defended herself from atop a sleek raft, wearing armor as always. She pushed her sword forward, calling out her moves as she executed them. Striking, stabbing, dodging, ducking, and slicing, lunging. As Pallas lunged, Athena used her shield to knock Pallas over. Rising from the waves, Pallas spit water into Athena's face. Hey! <laughs> Pallas spouted more water, somehow forming it into perfect concentric circles, like aquatic smoke rings. Athena couldn't help but laugh. Pallas, be serious. My father's coming to watch us spar tomorrow. We have to impress him. You have to impress him. If I impress him, you know where I'll end up. And my father won't be happy about that. You're filthy. You've heard the stories, and you have a hundred half-siblings to prove it. Thirty-seven. I have thirty-seven half-siblings. That's an army, warrior goddess. Let's go again. I want to get that spinning parry right. Athena was quite skilled in combat. It helped that she took to it naturally, like Pallas to water. She'd been ecstatic to hear Triton declare that they were finally good enough to spar in front of Zeus. The Proud Fathers had invited a crowd of gods, nymphs, and even a few mortals they fancied. Rowing out onto the lake, Athena fiddled with her helmet. She knew her armor made her look ferocious, but she still felt like a child in a woman's body. What if she fell off her raft? What if her mind went blank and she froze? What if her father, the king of the gods, thought she was only average? A terrifying column of water arose from the depths. Inside it, Pallas. She met Athena's eye and flashed a quick smile. Athena relaxed. She wasn't alone. She had Pallas. With her best friend beside her, Athena had nothing to worry about. They began to spar. In the audience, Zeus watched intently. Next to him, his wife Hera, the goddess of marriage, looked around, intent in a different way. Aphrodite has such a nice nose, don't you think? Sure. That's it. Slice and dodge. Well done. You've never noticed it? I guess it's fine, if you like noses. It looks quite like Athena's. Don't start on this again. I don't understand why you... She's going to fall in the water! A wave crashed over Athena, soaking her. 
Athena slipped, but kept her footing on the raft. Come on, Athena. You can do it. Get back up there. Raise that sword. You'll win this yet. They aren't actually fighting. It's a mock spar. At the end of which, my daughter will win. Zeus nervously watched Athena struggle through the next few maneuvers. She's going to fall and embarrass us. Us? She does have a mother. I knew it. I meant Athena and myself. As Zeus worried, Athena relaxed into the rhythm of the spar. She breathed deeply as she pressed her shield against Pallas's sword. Her instincts took over. Suddenly, a new heat rushed through Athena's veins. She'd never felt this warrior power before, but it possessed her. Her feet danced more nimbly. Her sword twisted more sharply. She tasted metal in her mouth. For the first time, she might want to kill. Across the lake, Zeus adjusted his shield. The sun gleamed off of it. Getting an idea, he tilted his shield, aiming the ray of light at Pallas. In the water, the light caught Pallas's eye. She looked up. Meanwhile, Athena stabbed toward Pallas's heart, a final flourish, the perfectly executed move she was born for. This was her gift, combat. Athena lunged, expecting Pallas to dodge as they had rehearsed. She didn't notice that Pallas's face was tilted up, distracted. Pallas looked toward Zeus as Athena's sword pierced her heart. Instead of blood, water flowed from Pallas's wound. She shrank, dissolving, until all that was left were her eyes, which transformed into two wiggling minnows. Pallas was dead. If you enjoyed listening to this preview of our episode on Athena and want to hear the rest of it, search and subscribe to Mythology wherever you listen to podcasts. New episodes release every Tuesday.